It sounds like you are in a mood to celebrate. What a great mood to be in on this occasion this evening. Welcome to the NCA Presidential Address and Awards Presentation General Session. I'm Stephen Beebe, First Vice President of NCA. This is indeed a special occasion. We also welcome those joining us via the internet this evening. Once a year, we gather to hear words of wisdom from the NCA president and celebrate the significant accomplishments of NCA members. And I offer a special welcome this evening to our award recipients, their families, friends, and colleagues. Before we present the awards, we will first hear President West's address titled, Difficult Dialogues, Difficult Choices. Envisioning NCA in an era of academic backlash, dwindling financial support, and a whole lot of frustration. I have known President West for many years. In fact, I know precisely how many years, because I was a brand new chair at then Southwest Texas State University, and I remember a phone call that I had trying to convince him to come to join my faculty. He made other plans. But he has blazed a trail of outstanding teaching, scholarship, and service. Let me tell you about his accomplishments. Dr. West is Professor of Communication Studies at Emerson College. He received his BA and MA in Communication at Illinois State University and his PhD at Ohio University. At Emerson, Ritt served as Director of the Institute for Liberal Arts and Interdisciplinary Studies and Chair of the Department of Communication Studies. During his time as Chair, the number of majors in the department rose over 60%. He stepped down as chair last spring to return to full-time teaching and is currently the director of Emerson's Washington, D.C. internship program. Rich is the co-author with former NCA President Lynn Turner of several leading books in communication, all in multiple editions. Perspectives on family communication, interpersonal communication, introducing communication theory, and gender in communication, and he's also served as co-editor of the SAGE source book of family communication. He's the author, co-author of over 40 articles and essays, and he's participated in over 100 NCA programs. Rich's work has appeared in Communication Quarterly, Communication Education, Qualitative Research, Reports in Communication, Communication Reports, Journal of Family Communication, among others. He's also served as guest co-editor of the Journal of Family Communication twice. And he currently sits on seven journal editorial boards. Rich's recent work intersects family, identity, and culture. Yet he admits of, to being somewhat of a scholarly nomad, exploring a number of different topics, including gay parenting, holiday stress, student questions in the classroom, job burnout, among other areas. He's currently investigating the role of, that Skype plays during family events such as birthdays and holidays. His work has appeared in a number of national and global outlets, including USA Today, Christian Science Monitor, Toronto Globe and Mail, The O'Reilly Factor, CBSNews.com, New Hampshire Public Radio, among others. Ritz served as one of the keynote speakers at the 2011 NCA Institute for Faculty Development. He is the recipient of outstanding alumni awards from both Illinois State University and Ohio University. He's also been recognized as an Eastern Communication Association Research Fellow and was the recipient of the ECA Past Presidents Award. In 2010, the Communication Institute for Online Scholarship named him a leading scholar in communication education. He served as president of the Eastern Communication Association and is currently completing his term as president of NCA. Difficult dialogues difficult choices, envisioning NCA in an era of academic backlash, dwindling financial support, and a whole lot of frustration. President Richard West. Thanks, Steve. So to begin, I want to give some special words to some very special people in my life. First, I want to introduce my partner, Chris. Chris is here. 
Uh, very few people, very few people have met Chris because I keep him locked in the closet until the national convention happens. Actually, there's nothing closeted about Chris, so let me move on here. Um, but truly, my appreciation to Chris for his support, his constant kind words, his sense of humor, and his focus on that very important question, why the hell did you do this, Rich? <laughs> Next, I congratulate, of course, all my colleagues sitting in the front row, who are probably all wondering how long I'm going to speak. One hour. No, I'm kidding. But really, whether you are an outstanding scholar, an outstanding teacher, or an outstanding leader in our association, I truly, truly, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for your contributions. And indeed, especially all of you who are students, I have a special pride for all of you. I also wish to congratulate Steve Beebe and his team for an outstanding Orlando experience. Steve is one of those rare people in our field who manages to make me mad and reflective at the same time. I'm actually mad because as I reflect on my own communication style, I wish I was more like him and not one of the 12 angry men. I also wish to recognize several of our past NCA presidents in our room today. I do extend additional appreciation to so many of you for what I think was an incredible foundation that you helped set over the years. And on a special private thought to probably one of our most successful, effective, and thoughtful NCA presidents, I offer this speech up to Sam Becker. And finally, I wish to thank a few special people who clearly have been instrumental in my life. And as a student of communication, my special thanks to three teacher scholars, all women, who provided me a foundation of respect and passion for communication. First, Sandra Metz at Illinois State University, someone who managed to help me understand that communication theory is both interesting and relevant, and whose instincts were spot on when after a pro-sem class, she said to me, I think you should go on and get your PhD. It is true, Sandra, Sandra remains as a key player in my pursuit of communication studies, so all of you who don't like what I have to say today, email Sandra at smmets at illstateu.edu with the subject line, what did you do? <laughs> Second, I'd like to acknowledge Beth Graham, originally from Ohio University, now at the University of Akron. As a doctoral student, I was privileged to have written an empirical article with Beth, and I came away with an experience working with one of the most thoughtful, rigorous, and ethical researchers in our field. And by the way, that article even has more resonance for me today since the topic was on job burnout. And third, Judy Pearson at North Dakota State University. And what can I say about Judy? Her ability to see through some of my language in my dissertation made me a better writer. As a matter of fact, to this day, I keep chapter one and I copy it off for my research method students because there's a wonderful line at the top of the front page that Judy had written, and it was this line. You cannot mask incomplete ideas with verbosity. But in addition, Judy's willingness to teach me what it means to give back to the discipline, and most of all, her belief that it's important not to take yourself too seriously, all have been values that I now impart to my graduate students. And all of you know, Judy is a past NCA president, so I was even more honored that an advisor advisee team became NCA presidents. So I feel like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, minus the red slippers, except last night. So I want to thank these three women who, to this day, resonate in profound ways. Finally, a shout out to Janice Anderson and Linda Moore, my two Emerson co-womanters. These two, Jan, my former dean, and Linda, my current vice president, taught me that being an administrator does not mean you sacrifice your integrity. It means you stay true to your moral compass and to try to make sure that students and the college are served best by your decision making. So thanks to these five women who helped shape me in ways that made me a better thinker, a better writer, and yes, a better communicator. So I wish to begin with a story that a few of you in here may have heard before, but it's just too good of a narrative to pass up. So let's face it, this is a pretty small world, and about five years ago, I experienced this global village firsthand. So picture it, 2007, I was a professor at another institution, and it was a Friday afternoon in October. This dorky looking guy walked into my office, and he asked about the communication major. He explained to me that he was re relocating to the area, and he wanted to take a few communication classes. So I talked to him a few minutes, he thanked me, but he never did give me his name. A few weeks later in the mail, I received this email. 
Dear Professor West, thanks for spending time with me talking about communications. I'm sorry that I took up your time when I decided to stay in Boston, but I so appreciated your thoughtfulness. I won't forget your willingness to sit with me on a late fall Friday afternoon. My best, Mark Zuckerberg. Not true, totally false, it's fabricated story. It's completely attention-getting device. So, <laughs> this afternoon, I find myself simultaneously looking inward and also outward. Since I joined NCA in 1984, which, by the way, was the same year that I listened to Madonna and Duran Duran and was still questioning my sexuality, in nearly 30 years, I've seen NCA emerge as a dynamic, relevant, engaged, if not unwieldy, association. These and other qualities provide and provoke my comments today. You see, I'm, I am convinced that despite the enormous progress that NCA has made over the decades, and it's been incredible, no doubt, we still need to confront, as the title of my presentation suggests, difficult dialogues and difficult choices. So over the next several minutes, in addition to wondering where I bought my suit, please travel with me as we consider several issues that I believe deserve our attention. I will att identify two big concerns and also offer some avenues that I believe resonate in a climate where travel budgets have been eviscerated, the public's perception of higher education is less than supportive, and many of you, like me, are getting exhausted from parents who hover, students who incessantly text in class, state legislators who think a college degree is overrated, and a sheer lack of resources to undertake anything innovative. If you think that's depressing, you should try watching Toddlers and Tierras. It's not one of the worst shows on TV. So while these are trying times in the academy at all levels, our resolve, our resiliency, and yes, our candor will get us through. I appreciate the words of Kafka. Don't bend. Don't water it down, don't try to make it logical, don't edit your own soul according to fashion. Rather, follow your most intense obsessions mercilessly. Okay, I will. My participation as a leader on NCA's executive committee over the span of seven years has given me a first-hand account of what I believe is working and what I believe needs our attention. As I talk here for the next several minutes, don't get me wrong, I love this organization, you all know that by now. I admire all of what you're doing, the incredible things in the classroom, in your communities, and certainly on campus. But I know that as I discuss the following, I will likely cause some anxiety, a little bit of uh, uncomfortability, a little bit of uncertainty, think Clint Eastwood with empty stool here. And I realized that just a few days ago, we had an opening session that articulated ways that our association can and should come together. Yet my position here is clear. Coming together requires sacrifice and a lot of honesty. So let's begin with two primary issues that have been on my mind these past several years. First, NCA has quickly turned into a cumbersome organization that tries to be all things to all people. This results in an academic organization that, in my view, is fast becoming what Adler called too big to make individual differences. Here is one fact about which you may not know. NCA is comprised of nearly 60 interest groups. Now, as a side note, the American Psychological Association, which has 150,000 members, has 54 interest groups. So you see that an organization that is 20 times our size has actually fewer interest groups. NCA's groups span topic areas that focus on a number of themes, including method, social activism, personal behavior, aging, academic level, academic space, race and ethnicity, and many other areas. So it's odd to me. Most of us are pretty absolute in admonishing those who say that everything can be defined as communication. Yet the way we've structured our national association suggests that pretty much everything is communication. Let me tech and contextualize this concern this way. If you're interested in putting forth a suggestion for an interest group, you simply need to get 100 people to sign a petition, request status from the executive committee and permission from the legislative assembly, and in all likelihood, your interest group will be formed. Actually, at the caucus level, the threshold goes to 50 signatures. So from my perspective, it's actually more difficult to get your driver's license renewed than it is to set up an interest group in the National Association. Moreover, many of our interest groups are redundant in mission and membership. 
and I believe this redundancy exists everywhere. NCA is comprised of a women's caucus and a feminist and women's studies division. We have an Asian Pacific communication studies division and an Asian Pacific American caucus. We have an applied communication division, experiential learning division, you get the point, the list goes on. Now, of course, I know and I recognize that each of these have variations and a lot of membership and a lot of missions. But over the years, I've heard more than once that the caucuses were established to provide the association a more activist opportunity, although I've never discovered any evidence of this anywhere in the archives. So this is somewhat of like an imaginary fact, like uh, um, Carl Rove thinking one Ohio. So to offset some of my concern on the proliferation of new units, in 2011 convention, I reduced slot allocation 20%. I also did not accept programs that represented only one school. I used to call those faculty meetings, not convention programs. So I did this to allow units to think more collaboratively and to avoid the repetitiveness in programming across units. In fact, one motivation for my behavior was a convention that happened several years ago. There was a convention at this, in this particular location and it had 20 programs on mentorship. Now, at this point, I didn't think we need to have any more programs on mentorship. We know it's wisdom, engagement, social capital, social psychological support. But that year, we had a 30% programming that was attended by less than five people, resulting in more panelists than audience and more arbitrary cancellations of programs than ever, and in many cases, a lot of embarrassment. But I'll tell you, people were not happy with my move. Some people in this room were not happy with me. But my question is simple and poignant. Is NCA really that large and diverse in scope that we need to have units that are so plentiful and so repetitive? You may disagree with me, but I don't think redundancy is a good thing. I used to believe that everyone deserves a seat at the table, but now, frankly, I think the table's about full. And it's not ending. Over the past six months, I've received word about the development of five new interest groups which are on the horizon. I can't believe that this is the most thoughtful direction to go. Actually, no, I don't believe that this is the most thoughtful direction to go. In addition to a cumbersome organization, a second concern that resonates with me relates to the need to get our association in the national media. And let me quickly point out that we've done a great deal in this area, but it's the proverbial step forward and then two steps backwards. In October, NCA had a great program, phenomenal program, looking at the 1992 presidential debates at the University of Richmond. But wouldn't you know it that our program happened less than 48 hours after the second Obama-Romney debate, thereby cutting into national public relations that the event could have elicited. And the relationships we've cultivated with national science organizations, while admirable, are rarely, if not ever, reported on NBC or CBS, and certainly unless it's Katy Perry playing with test tubes, you're not going to get TMZ to report it. We have no national press publications such as Psychology Today that is continually sought after by local and national media which would further our discipline to the world. And I'm not through. To make matters worse, when some of our NCA members find themselves part of a national conversation because of their expertise, I think some troubles loom because some of our own don't acknowledge our communication roots. Two quick examples. On C-SPAN in October, I watched an NCA member identify as a political scientist. On a public radio station in August, I listened to an NCA member talk about deception and stated the background in social psychology. So I was speechless, a little like George Foreman without his grill. But where is the loyalty? Now this is a small C concern. This doesn't keep me up at night. But yet we need to get these items on our agenda, if for any other reason, to get the respect that this phenomenal organization deserves. And it is a phenomenal organization. We need both to proclaim our allegiance to NCA and our discipline of study and teaching, and we need to correct others or ensure those in the media that we are communication experts and not random political scientists or social psychologists. So are we doing anything right? You know the answer, of course. It's unequivocally yes. We're doing a lot of things right. Our organization and its members are doing fantastic things. In fact, last year in New Orleans, one of my series was a Voices of Consciousness series, which celebrated what the incredible things that our NCA members are doing in our communities. And we are, as Michael Beatty found out many years ago, some of the most effective teachers on college campuses. In addition, we have members who have advanced our discipline in both and small and large ways. But we're not moving the media dial. I'm a realist, and I know that we're not going to get Dr. Oz to report on us unless we all come down with Legionnaires. But is there a reason that we're not foregrounding the great things that our national office and our members are undertaking? 
Listen to this. In one week in late, uh, late October, APA and its journals were cited by CNN, US News, Fox News, CBS News, and Huffington Post. In that same week, the American Sociological Association and its journals were cited by CNN, Time, and Christian Science Monitor on topics related to divorce, binge drinking, and marriage equality. We definitely have movement in the right direction, but we need to showcase our association in more grand ways. And so finally, as the title of my presentation suggests, we need to re-envision NCA. Now, how does this re-envisioning occur? Well, I don't propose radical overall here, overhaul here, but there are some issues that really need our immediate attention. I hope at the very least, if we are not re-envisioning, we are reinvigorating. So let me be direct this time. But this time, let me employ this ubiquitous thing that Queen Elizabeth, Queen Latifah, and Queen Elton John all have in common, and that they've all appeared on television. Let me use television as a metaphor in re-envisioning NCA. Let's continue to emphasize the value of CSI, or what I refer to as communication is still important. If we, as I hope, continue to believe this value, why are we not promoting it in more, in more important ways? Nearly 15 years ago, the National Office moved from Annandale, Virginia to DC. One of the primary reasons for this move related to being near the political pulse of our country. I think we may have overlooked the obvious here. There's been a lot of wonderful movements connecting with DC, but why aren't we engaging political leaders to ensure that communication courses are required in public schools? Why aren't, what sorts of informal or formal advocacy efforts should we undertake with education officials? Currently, we have only a handful of states that require some sort of communication or speech requirement. Shouldn't that number be 50, given the society that we find ourselves in these days? We have almost a dozen interest groups at NCA that would have some expertise in this area. It's time to collate their talents and put this topic on their collective agendas. My second vector relates to the NCA community interface. That is, we need to spend more than 60 minutes helping out our society. Although I am impressed with our NCA colleagues, I'm a little bit distressed that we as an association haven't figured out how to parlay our experience into solving some of culture's most pressing issues and problems. I realize that we can only do so much. But when I was in New Orleans and with 100 NCA members working with Habitat for Humanity, I kept thinking about the lack of a coherent association-wide effort in being other-centered. So I challenge our association and think beyond the journals, think beyond the classroom, and yes, the office, and talk about this issue in very measurable ways. On a related note, I would encourage us to move toward what one could argue would be real world scholarship, a topic that was discussed to some extent a few years ago by Commonographs and Applied Commerce Search. As Steve noted, I sit on several editorial boards and I can say that the most interesting articles that I review are those that seem to talk about issues that resonate with my family, with my job, my place of worship, and my friends. And yet, I agree with Larry Fry who admitted the following, let's face it, whether they are descriptive, interpretive, or critical, or qualitative, quantitative, or rhetorical, research studies themselves seldom make a difference. He concludes by noting that most of the 15,000 studies are rarely read even by scholars. Harwood equally direct in our discussing our research, and he states, we have not made as much of a contribution as we might. He challenges us to rethink theoretical methodological practices and priorities in order to make unique disciplinary contributions. Finally, an update related to this as of this morning. Some of you may recall reading in my first Spectre essay that I challenged our association to begin thinking about a journal that has social activism at its core. I'm pleased to report that an insightful and intuitive colleague at the University of Louisiana in Lafayette, Du Kin Kim, took me up on this challenge and has already assembled a world-class proposal which was just discussed a couple hours ago with a leading publisher. This, my friends, is what making a difference is all about. And indeed, I believe that such a publication will go a long way to show that NCA does care about social advocacy and social justice from same-sex marriage to marital fidelity. I believe that these sorts of efforts help position NCA as an organization that addresses Adler's concerns of not making a difference. A third way I re-envision NCA is through the voice of each of you. It's an ongoing theme in these sorts of speeches, but it's clearly time to re-engage yourselves in NCA. In other words, get involved. Let me read this part of an email I received a few months ago. Rich, I'm tired of seeing all the same names in this association. Are you doing anything to get more people involved? That was from a friend, too. So I informed her that we had 168 volunteer slots that we were looking for this year for the NCA leadership. 
So we need to somehow make a subordinate mission of NCA the need, and I'm going to add one word, the expectation to volunteer and engage. We have so many opportunities, some that don't require a lot of time, and the executive committee about three months ago just approved paying a $10 an hour volunteer stipend. Not true again. <laughs> Finally, we need to see the view of the field through our basic communication course. In my second spectral column this year, I propose that NCA begin to work on something that we've ignored for quite some time, which is the basic course. Both publicly and privately have lamented about the numerous approaches to the basic course. Whereas psychology and sociology have structure and context, it's pretty much consistent in their introductory courses, communication does not. We're public speaking to some, theory to others. On another campus, we're hybrid, and another school teaches it as historical. Down the road, the basic course may be interpersonal. Up the block, it's mediated in nature. We are in a tough situation, I believe, if we, as one of the social sciences, cannot define or interpret our area of study and teaching in a consistent way. Again, some of you may disagree with me, and you may contend that such diversity in approaches is a hallmark of various intellectual traditions. I do not. As I noted in Spectra, I believe NCA needs to take the lead in re-envisioning the basic communication course and develop some template of consistency across the country. It's the only introduction to our discipline that hundreds of thousands of students get. And my question is, should they really be talking about at least six different ways of understanding communication as they talk about one communication course? As NCA moves along here, I encourage all of us to have a little will and grace as we talk about the difficult dialogues ahead. I am a fan of open disagreement and debate, as I noted in the recent Spectra column. Being willing to share your views and my views, I think, is, necess is a necessary ingredient for a communication association. Yet legislative assembly meetings should not be then used for ad hominem attacks. CritNet is not intended as a forum to silence dissenters. The national office is not there for any of us to vent about membership fees. Interest group chairs are not trying to give you the runaround. And the executive committee is not a power hungry group. We're just hungry. We are a very diverse organization. We are not all liberal, we are not all researchers, and we all don't like Anderson Cooper. My point here is to engage in the same level of tolerance we ask our students to achieve. As you listen to these words today, I also want you to realize that in just a few minutes, we will be introduced to some of the most talented and resourceful NCA colleagues. They and these people are our future. What they have managed to do is harness their abilities and their gifts in ways that make our association shine. And it's precisely because of these people seated here and because of the extraordinary support of hundreds of volunteers in this organization that even with my reservations, I continue to hold this association and its members in high esteem. Yet we must move to higher levels of excellence. Let's be real and let's be candid about the issues we, we face because the stakes are too high. Because the future of NCA is really what we wish it to be, we must stay true to who we are and recognize our strengths and our shortcomings. And I'm reminded of Thomas Jefferson's words in matters of style, swim with current, in matters of principle, stand like a rock. Or maybe my 78-year-old mother said it best, honey, always remember that being honest will always get you more friends, and I know you desperately need friends. <laughs> so I leave this role as president with great pride, genuine hope, and deep gratitude that I'm part of an organization where people dare to imagine what can be. Thank you. I have the pleasure of starting our awards ceremony, and NCA is pleased to recognize the achievement and the distinguished accomplishments of each of our winners today. I am delighted to honor each this, this evening, each winner joins a venerable group of scholars and educators who have been honored for achieving excellence in teaching, scholarship, and service. So it's my pleasure to welcome back to the stage First Vice President Steve Beebe, who will help me honor this year's recipients. Again, good evening. Our first award presented this evening is the Community College Outstanding Educator Award. The Community College Outstanding Educator Award recognizes individuals who've made outstanding contributions to education at community colleges while exemplifying excellence in teaching, scholarship, and service to the communication discipline. 
This year, the award is presented to Robert Leonard of Sinclair Community College. The award committee was unanimous in choosing Dr. Leonard for this award. His willingness to continue field and then share it in a passionate manner with his students sets him apart from many in our field. He has successfully demonstrated the ability to relate to his students and to earn both their respect and their praise. Dr. Leonard is an example to all of community college faculty. Congratulations, Robert Leonard. The Donald H. Eckroyd Award for Outstanding Teaching in Higher Education is given to honor an NCA member who exemplifies superlative teaching in higher education. This year, the award is presented to Richard A. Cherwitz of the University of Texas, Austin. In 1996, Dr. Churwitz created the Intellectual Entrepreneurship in Initiative at the University of Texas, Austin, for the purpose of increasing communication and learning across disciplines. Under his direction, over 6,000 undergraduate and graduate students, representing 90 academic disciplines, have participated in the initiative. A former student notes, by selfishly dedicating his senior career to improving higher education in an era of unprecedented change and uncertainty in academia, he has indeed personified a commitment to transforming lives both on his campus and at institutions of higher learning throughout the country. Congratulations, Richard Churwitz. The Wallace A. Bacon Lifetime Teaching Excellence Award recognizes the teaching excellence of retired college and university faculty members. This year, the award is presented to David Zarefsky of Northwestern University. The name David Zarefsky has become synonymous with NCA. Dr. Zarefsky is known as a past president of NCA, outstanding scholar, author of numerous publications, and has a lifetime of personal dedication to the various committees of NCA. But perhaps most importantly, he is known as an outstanding educator. Several former students speak to the value of his commitment to quality instruction. One student stated, those who have witnessed his teaching since 1970s report a clarity in the classroom combined with an engaging demeanor, a sense of humor and humility, and a gift for asking questions in ways that press students to think for themselves. Another student said, David modeled what it takes to become a scholar. And I might note I attended Dr. Zarefsky's seminar at Hope College this last summer and can personally attest to his teaching excellence. Congratulations, David Zarefsky. The Bernard J. Brommel Award for Outstanding Scholarship or Distinguished Service in Family Communication recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions to the area of family communication. This year, the award is presented to Paul Schroet of Texas Christian University. <laughs> Dr. Schroet was chosen for his superb contributions to both scholarship and service to family communication. In his short 10-year career, Dr. Schroet has published over 55 journal articles in many of the top-tier journals of our field. One of his nominators said this, Schroet has done more than perhaps any other communication scholar to illuminate the behavioral complexities of stepfamily and co-parental relationships. At the same time, he tirelessly serves our discipline. Dr. Schroet is a highly awarded educator, an advisor, an editorial member of many journals, and a leader in NCA and CSA. Dr. Schroet truly embodies the spirit of this award. Congratulations, Paul Schroet.
The Charles H. Wilbert Research Award is presented to an NCA member who has published a journal article or book chapter that has stood the test of time and has become the stimulus for new conceptualizations of speech communication phenomena. This year, the award is presented to John Lucatus of Indiana University for his article, Visualizing the People, Individualism versus Collectivism in Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Published in 1997, Quarterly Journal of Speech, Dr. Lucatus' article introduced a rethinking of the nature of public address to fit the multi-mass mediated nature of the phenomenon. This reconceptualization led to the flourishing of research and teaching in what is now called visual rhetoric. Dr. Lucatus' work addressed the fundamental challenge faced by democracy in mass media era, namely the need to manage the tensions between the collective and individual in a technologically overdetermined rhetorical culture that ministers to an increasingly diverse and perhaps even globalized multicultural society. Accepting for John Lucatus is Bob Harriman. Congratulations, John Lucatus. The Diamond Anniversary Book Award is presented to the authors of the most outstanding scholarly book published during the last two years. This year, two Diamond Anniversary Book Awards are being presented. The first award is presented to John Daly of the University of Texas, Austin. It's to honor him for his book, Advocacy, Championing Ideas and Influencing Others. In his book, Dr. Daly defines advocacy as both a scholarly treatment of persuasion and an instructional guide which draws its principles and numerous examples from rhetorical theory, interpersonal and organizational communication, and most inventively, from the history of ideas. Advocacy means persuading people who matter to care about your issue, says Daly. It's about being listened to about being at the table when decisions are made, being heard by people who make decisions. It's about facing and overcoming resistance. Dr. Daly's comprehensive book offers readers a manual that explains how to successfully shape, shape opinion, inspire action, and achieve results. Congratulations, John Daly. The second Diamond Anniversary Book Award is presented to Kate Kinsky of the University of Arizona, Bruce Hardy of Louisiana State University, and Kathleen Hall Jamison of the University of Pennsylvania for their book, The Obama Victory, How Media, Money, and Message Shaped the 2008 Election. Electoral campaigns more often strengthen and perhaps activate existing beliefs than win over undecided voters or convert disbelievers. But in nearly every presidential contest, there are vital moments when the news cycle is interrupted and YouTube lights up. As often as not, candidates' gaffes get the kind of media attention rather than an opponent's stellar presentation. The Obama victory is an authoritative source on the reasons for shifts in voter preference for presidential candidates in the course of the 2008 campaign. As against the conventional scholarly wisdom that electoral campaigns have minimal effects, the authors combine theory, rhetorical analysis, media study, and Annenberg survey data to account for these shifts. Congratulations, Kate Kinsky, Bruce Hardy, and Kathleen Hall Jamison. The Donald P. Cushman Memorial Award honors top-ranked student-authored paper from all NCA interest groups that competitively rank papers for programming at the NCA Annual Convention. This year, the award is of the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, for his paper, Silence in the Crowd, The Spiral of Silence Contributing to the Positive Bias of Opinions in an Online Review System. Mr. Askey's qualitative analysis of community discussion forums examined the positive bias of opinions found in an online review system. 
Using the spiral of silence theory as a framework for analysis, Askey reveals that fear of retaliation and isolation from the community reduces the willingness of members to voice minority neutral and or negative reviews. The nature of posting non-anonymously provided unique perspective into both the spiral of silence theory and computer-mediated communication, this study successfully incorporated users' voices as evidence in the results, helping the reader interpret an enormous amount of data within manageable themes and succinct writing. Congratulations, David Askey. The Douglas W. Inager Distinguished Rhetorical Scholar Award honors scholars who have executed research programs in rhetorical theory, rhetorical criticism, and or public address studies while demonstrating intellectual creativity, perseverance, and impact on academic communities. This year, the award is presented to Sonia K. Foss of the University of Colorado, Denver. Dr. Foss is one of our most prolific and provocative rhetorical scholars, and she's done much to broaden and extend the field with her groundbreaking work in feminist rhetoric and visual communication. She not only helped establish feminist rhetoric as an important area of research in the field, but also has encouraged us to view rhetoric itself more broadly and creatively. In showing the different forms that women's speaking can take, she has encouraged us to imagine new, less confrontational ways of doing and understanding rhetoric. For blazing the trail of feminist rhetorical scholarship and for her important contributions to pedagogy and graduate education, Dr. Foss is richly deserving of this award. Congratulations, Sonia Foss. The Gerald M. Phillips Award for Distinguished Applied Communication Scholarship recognized the author of a body of published research in creative scholarship in applied communication. This year, the award is presented to Howard Giles of the University of California, Santa Barbara. Dr. Giles demonstrates that applied research can be theoretically driven and cross-culturally validated. He extended studies of intergroup communication to intergenera intergenerational issues, including elder abuse and death and dying. His communication predicament model of aging reveals the intergenerational chasm to be a cultural, social, communicative construction and a detriment to the well-being of all generations worldwide. He founded a series with more than a dozen books on such applied issues as communication and cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and bullying. Dr. Giles has advanced theory, research, and practice in applied communication and made a direct service contributions, a combination rare in any discipline and well-deserving of this award. Congratulations, Howard Giles. The Gerald R. Miller Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award recognizes new scholars who have recently completed their dissertations. This year, two Gerald R. Miller Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Awards are being presented. The first award presented to Thomas Dunn of Colorado State University. Dr. Dunn's dissertation entitled, Queerly Remembered, Tactical and Strategic Rhetorics for Representing the GLBQT Past, explores a turn toward strategic public memories in the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer community that endure heterosexual forgetting, persist through time, and exert greater control in spaces of power. Examining four case studies, Dr. Dunn's dissertation examines possibilities and pitfalls of this strategic turn for securing greater GLBTQ rights. A committee member noted that this dissertation provides a thorough and thoughtful rhetorical history, the depth and flow of which are exemplary. Congratulations, Thomas Dunn. The second Gerald R. Miller Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award is presented to Christy Ledford of the Uniformed Services University for Health Sciences.
Dr. Ledford's dissertation entitled Improving Patient Outcomes Through Physician Communication and Presentation Mode Influence on the Walking Behavior of Type 2 Diabetics analyzes and evaluates the influence of physicians' communication strategies on promoting exercise by people suffering from type 2 diabetes. Using prospect theory and the elaboration likelihood model, this study includes a qualitative analysis of physicians' exercise promotion and an experimental test of the effectiveness of various message frames and presentation modes in a single six-site, six-week prospective intervention program. The results show how physicians need to tailor their messages, such as using statistics with those who are involved in managing their health and graphs with those who are not involved, an award committee noted this. This research is the perfect example of theoretically driven scholarship that makes a difference in our world. Congratulations, Christy Ledford. The Golden Anniversary Monograph Award is presented to the most outstanding scholarly monographs published during the previous calendar year. This year, the Golden Anniversary Monograph Award is presented for two monographs. The first award is presented to Leanne Noblock, the University of Illinois, Lynn Noblock Fetters of Northwestern University, and C. Emily Durbin of Michigan State University for their monograph, Depressive Symptoms and Relational Uncertainty as Predictors of Reassurance Seeking and Negative Feedback Seeking in Conversation. It is rare to encounter a research report that extends the communication field both methodologically and theoretically. Doctors Noblock, Noblock Fetters, and Durbin successfully applied a complex methodology pioneered in psychology to study dyadic interaction. Their laboratory study involved recruiting romantic dyads from an urban community to talk for 50 minutes on multiple topics likely to evoke conflict. Additionally, the research team crafted novel measurement techniques for rating reassurance-seeking and negative feedback-seeking behavior in these conversations. The study yielded impressive results that elevate communication research in the interdisciplinary community of depression scholarship. The selection committee applauds these researchers for successfully completing a challenging research project about an important issue in health communication. Congratulations, Leanne Noblock, Lynn Noblock-Fetters, and C. Emily Durbin. The second Golden Anniversary Monograph Award is presented to Brian Ott of the University of Colorado Denver, Eric Aoki of Colorado State University, and Greg Dickinson of Colorado State University for their monograph, Ways of Not Seeing Guns, Presence and Absence at the Cody Firearms Museum. The The Golden Anniversary Monograph Awards Selection Committee also recognizes the work of Drs. Ott, Aoki, and Dickinson as an outstanding exemplar of cultural criticism practiced through case study. The author's cultural critique of the Cody Firearms Museum's visual space is provocative. They argue that because the museum displays guns in minimal historical and cultural context, museum goers can miss the obvious function of guns to serve as lethal weapons. These authors intersperse their critique with personal reflections and thus employ autoethnographic methods to discuss violence, masculinity, and the settlement of the Western U.S. in ways that challenge conventional thinking. Congratulations to Brian Ott, Eric Aoki, and Greg Dickinson. The Franklin S. Heyman Award for Distinguished Scholarship in Freedom of Expression is given to the authors of published research on freedom of expression. This year, the award is presented to Leslie J. Renard, Washburn, Washburn University, for her research article, The Fire Eaters Surrender to General Sherman, Savannah Newspapers, 1864-1865.
This is a deeply thought-provoking work of superb scholarship, which examines the way Union generals influenced news coverage after taking control of Savannah, Georgia at the end of the Civil War. Dr. Renard's work stands out for the way it provides a skillfully researched historical sense of how free speech and free press issues regarding information on government activity unfolded in the American era before encompass such issues. It does one of the most important things that good historical research can do, laying out a useful counterfactual for considering American life without our court's current broad interpretation of First Amendment freedoms. The Fire Eater's Surrender ably demonstrate what happens when the press is used to further either an editor's or an invader's view of human events. Congratulations, Leslie Renard. The James A. Winans and Herbert A. Wichelms Memorial Award honors distinguished scholarship in rhetoric and public address. This year, the award is presented to Samuel McCormick of San Francisco State University for the, this book, Letters to Power. Dr. McCormick's study invites us to reconsider rhetorical theory in fundamental ways. In particular, Letters to Power invites us to consider how rhetorical resources and dynamics change when those without presumptive claims to a power seek to exercise influence by employing a medium, the letter, more often associated with the private sphere than with the public. Letters to Power is significant not only as a work for rhetorical theory, it has contemporary relevance in a world in which the office of the public intellectual is in lamentable decline, while access to digital modes of broadcast have proliferated. The committee found McCormick's study to be imaginative in conception, incorporating the work of Seneca, Christine Piazzan, Kant, and Kierkegaard, and skillful in execution. Here's what they said, illuminating, thought-provoking, and insightful. Letters to Power reveals how public intellectuals today can use the public letter as a way to unveil power without suffering its crushing blows. Congratulations, Samuel McCormick. The James L. Golden Outstanding Student Essay and Rhetoric Award recognizes outstanding essays by undergraduate or pre-master's graduate students focusing on the history, theory, or criticism of rhetoric. This year, the award is presented to Tiara Foster, Syracuse University, for her essay, Sights on Palin, Revealing an American Enemy Through Enemy Ship and Metaphorical Analysis. Ms. Foster's paper takes up two of the most important questions of our day. How do rhetors symbolically create enemies? And what relationship exists between symbolically destroying one's enemies and materially violent acts meant to kill political leaders? Using Sarah Palin's rhetoric and the assassination attempt on Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords as, in her, case, as her case study, Ms. Foster carefully traces the ways that Palin's rhetoric portrays Democrats, congressional supporters of health care reform, and Barack Obama as enemies of the United States. Her systemic and theoretically grounded analysis of enemyship illuminates the process by which Palin and other rhetors dehumanize and ritually kill one another. Ms. Foster's paper thus asks questions about Rator's risks, rights, and responsibilities. The paper also addresses vexing but essential issues of communication ethics while avoiding simplistic claims of causality between Palin's rhetoric and the attack on Congresswoman Giffords. For these reasons, the judges selected Ms. Foster's outstanding student essay as this year's winner. Congratulations, T.R. Foster. The Carl R. Wallace Memorial Award seeks to foster and promote philosophical, historical, or critical scholarship of recent, P recent PhDs or advanced doctoral students in rhetoric and public address. This year, the award is presented to Dave Tell of the University of Kansas.
Dr. Tell's eagerly expected book, Confessional Crises in Cultural Politics in 20th Century America, is poised to make a lasting disciplinary contributions beyond his already formidable array of journal articles. In addition, Dr. Tell's seemingly tireless research and teaching activities have already earned recognition from multiple professional organizations. He is equally worthy of recognition for the promise of his current research project, a book manuscript in preparation titled Rhetoric, Regionalism, and Cultural politics. Such is a brief summary of the many professional attributes that make Dr. Tell, in the words of one nominator, a force to be reckoned with. Congratulations, Dave Tell. The Leslie Irene Coger Award for Distinguished Performance is given to a director, producer, teacher, or performer who has contributed an outstanding body of live performances. This year, the award is presented to Karen S. Mitchell of the University of Northern Iowa. For two decades, Dr. Karen Mitchell has created compelling performances of literature and personal narrative devoted to social change. She has worked with students to craft work advancing our understandings of gender, sexuality, race, immigrant labor, violence in relationships, and the plight of prisoners, often under the patronage of competitive federal, state, and local grants. Her nominators and the Coger Award Committee recognize extraordinary artistic achievement as an ambassador of performance and its contributions to university, disciplinary, and cultural missions to improve civil life and personal relationships. That so many of her students pursue graduate degrees and have begun influencing a new generation testifies to the enduring value of Dr. Mitchell, Mitchell's body of work. Congratulations, Karen Mitchell. The Lila A. Heston Award for Outstanding Scholarship in Interpretation and Performance Studies recognizes individual scholarly contributions to interpretation and performance studies. This year, the award is presented to Reagan Fox of California State University, Long Beach. Within the last three years, Dr. Fox has published six performance-focused essays in peer-reviewed journals, including five in Text and Performance Quarterly and one in the Western Journal of Communication. With five essays in our association's flagship journal in performance studies, he is the most published author in TPQ in the last half decade. Dr. Fox has demonstrated his work's relevance across a variety of approaches, autoethnography, new media, poetic literature, and social movements politics. His work has touched us personally and inspired us professionally by solving methodological problems and offering procedures for materializing and challenging memory. Congratulations, Reagan Fox. The Mark L. Knapp Award in Interpersonal Communication recognizes individuals who have made significant scholarly contributions to the study of interaction and or relational processes while contributing to the quality of interpersonal communication through active involvement in the discipline. This year, the award is presented to Mary Ann Fitzpatrick of the University of South Carolina. Dr. Fitzpatrick is an internationally recognized scholar in interpersonal communication. She has authored over 100 articles, chapters, and books, and been the recipient of grants from the National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Mental Health, and the Spencer Foundation. The primary focus of Dr. Fitzpatrick's research has been on communication processes in marriage and other family issues. She is one of the intellectual founders of relational and family communication. Her book, between Husbands and Wives remains one of the most important works written on its subject and her typological model of how couples interact and have shaped the thinking, they have shaped the thinking of generations of communication scholars. Dr. Fitzpatrick personifies what the Knapp Award was designed to recognize and celebrate. Extraordinary contributions to the field of interpersonal communication. Congratulations, Mary Ann Fitzpatrick.
the Stephen E. Lucas Debut Publication Award. It aims to identify and praise a contribution to the discipline by an author publishing a first scholarly book or monograph. This year, the award is presented to Christine J. Gardner of Wheaton College for her book, Making Chastity Sexy, The Rhetoric of Evangelical Abstinence Campaigns. Dr. Gardner's study of evangelical Christian abstinence campaigns generates fascinating insights into the incongruities stemming from the influence strategies they employ. These include casting the seemingly negative choice of abstinence as a positive lifestyle, valorizing traditional gender roles while subverting them, using sexiness to sell abstinence from sex, and blurring the lines about what sex really is while asserting that the lines are clear. Dr. Gardner's analysis is is conceptually sophisticated and goes into great depths. The study blends textual analysis and ethnographic fieldwork, comparing U.S. to sub-Saharan African approaches to advocating abstinence. Dr. Gardner shows considerable differences between U.S. and African strategies and ties these to cultural differences. Gardner's book makes a substantial and unique contribution to our understanding of religious rhetoric. Congratulations, Christine Gardner. The Robert J. Kibler Memorial Award recognizes someone with the personal and professional qualities of dedication to excellence, a commitment to the profession, concern for others, vision of what could be, and acceptance of diversity and forthrightness. This year the award is presented to Ronald Jackson of the University of Cincinnati. Dr. Jackson is one of the leading communication and identity scholars in the nation. His research examines how theories of identity relate to intercultural and gender communication. In his teaching and research, he explores how and why people negotiate and define themselves as they do. Additionally, Dr. Jackson's research included empirical, conceptual, and critical approaches to the study of masculinity, identity negotiation, whiteness, and Afrocentricity. He teaches intercultural communication as the author of 10 books. Dr. Melbourne S. Cummings, a past Kibler recipient, said this, Dr. Jackson is one of the most innovative and active researchers in the discipline. His writing explores areas that our more established researchers have written little or nothing at all. Congratulations, Ronald Jackson. This next award has special meaning this evening. As many of you know, Sam Becker passed away last week. For those of us who knew him, he will be missed not just as an NCA member, but as a truly remarkable person. For those who did not have the gift of knowing him, Sam was a pillar of the discipline and one of our most respected and cherished members. As a past president of NCA, we have lost not just a leader, but a legend. He is the inspiration for the Samuel L. Becker Distinguished Service Award, an award that honors an NCA member who has given outstanding cumulative service in research, teaching, and a service to both NCA and the profession. This year, the award is presented to Linda L. Putnam of the University of California, Santa Barbara. Dr. Putnam's research focuses on negotiation and conflict management in organizations, discourse studies in organizations, and gender and negotiation. Her early research centered on communication strategies and tactics in teachers' bargaining. Her professional service includes being associate editor for human relations and organization, membership on editorial boards for eight journals, co-editor of four handbooks, and has served as both guest editor and co-editor of six special issues. Past NCA President Don Braithwaite said this about our honoree this evening. 
There are few members of our association and discipline whose service has made a wider impact to the present and future of the discipline. Dr. Putnam is a visionary and aggressive leader who has served NCA and the breadth of our discipline. Congratulations, Linda Putnam. The Distinguished Scholar Award recognizes and rewards a lifetime of scholarly achievement in the study of communication. It is my pleasure to announce the 2012 recipients of this honor. They are Dr. Arthur P. Buckner of the University of South Florida, Dr. Robert Craig of the University of Colorado Boulder, Dr. John Lucatus of Indiana University, and Dr. Peter Mangi of the University of Southern California. The first Distinguished Scholar Award is presented to Dr. Art Bachner. <laughs> Dr. Bachner has been instrumental in bringing qualitative inquiry, specifically ethnographic and narrative inquiry, into communication studies, particularly in the areas of family and relational communication. His work to legitimate interpretive and critical inquiry in social science has helped to enable others in communication to pursue such work as well. His record of publication is quite impressive. Over the span of his career, Dr. Bachner has contributed numerous chapters to books and has co-authored three books and authored his most recent book, Coming to Narrative, Meaning and Method in a University of Life. He's also had many articles published in Narrative Inquiry, Review of Communication, and International Review of Qualitative Research. Dr. Bachner has served as editor on several special issues of Journal of Applied Communication Research, Qualitative Inquiry, and the Journal of Contemporary Ethnography. Along with Dr. Carolyn Ellis, Dr. Bachner edited the Ethnographic Alternatives book series from 1995 to 2006, and they currently edit the book series Writing Lives, Ethnographic Narratives. Dr. Bachner's long list of honors and distinction include, but are not limited to, being named Distinguished University Professor at the University of South Florida, the institution's highest and most exclusive academic rank, President of the National Communication Association, and recipient of the Elizabeth Anderson Award for sustained contributions to speech communication and education and research over his entire career. The research of his scholarship and influence is evident in his keynote addresses university lectures and workshops, both here in the U.S. and around the world. Congratulations, Arthur P. Bachner. The next Distinguished Scholar Award is presented to Dr. Robert Craig. Dr. Craig has made distinguished contributions to scholarship in communication theory and philosophy, discourse studies, and related fields in a career spanning more than three decades. His most significant cumulative contribution has been to articulate a fundamental philosophical theory of communication study as a practical discipline. This line of thought extends in many directions and confronts a host of questions about the historical development of communication and communication and media studies in relation to communication as an evolving cultural category. The field's internal coherence and relations with cognitive fields and other conceptual questions in meta theory, epistemology, methodology, scholarship, and education. Dr. Craig's large body of work on communication study as a practical discipline is notable for its scholarly range, conceptual originality, intellectual rigor, coherent development, and cumulative impact on the field. His widely cited award-winning article, Communication Theory as a Field, contributed to a broad overview of conceptual model of communication theory. Apart from this large, multi-dimensional body of work in communication theory and philosophy, Dr. Craig has made important empirical and methodological contributions to the interdisciplinary field of discourse studies since the late 1970s, with his later development of meta-discursive approach to theory and practice, spawning new lines of empirical research in discourse studies. Congratulations, Robert Craig. The next Distinguished Scholar Award is presented to Dr. John Lucatus. 
Dr. Lucatus is one of the premier scholars in the study of rhetoric and public address and is recognized in a number of disciplines as an intellectual leader in the study of photojournalism and visual culture. After establishing himself as one of the leading young scholars in rhetorical studies, he began a series of productive collaborations that have produced two award-winning books, No Caption Needed, Iconic Photographs, Public Culture, and Liberal Democracy. They examine how visual images foster deliberation and critique, noting photojournalism as a valuable contribution to a democratic society. His other book, Crafting Equality, America's Anglo-African Word, chronicles how the meaning of equality shifts from 1760 to the present. Interactions and negotiations made between different social groups in American politics and culture. Dr. Lucatus also has two edited volumes and many additional articles and chapters and other presentations, including a highly regarded blog. Along the way, he's also acquired a distinguished record as an editor. That work is highlighted by his serving recently as the editor of the Quarterly Journal of Speech, the flagship journal in rhetorical studies. None of this has come at the expense of other contributions. He has also had a stellar record of accomplishment in teaching and university and professional service. Dr. Lucatus is a model in collaboration and an exemplar of how academic practices and media can change while still producing work that meets the highest standards of scholarly rigor. Accepting for Dr. Lucatus is Bob Harriman. Congratulations, John Lucatus. The next Distinguished Scholar Award is presented to Dr. Peter Manji. Over his 40-year career, Dr. Manji has distinguished himself as one of the most influential scholars of organizational communication and communication technology. Dr. Manji was one of the original proponents of systems theory and communication research, authoring one of the two most influential articles on this theoretical perspective and contributing significantly to methods for conducting systems research. In connection with this work, he was influential in introducing multivariate statistical analysis, those techniques, into communication research during the late 1970s and 1980s. Dr. Manji has made significant contributions to theory and research on communication and networked organization, an important new organizational form. His research on virtual organizations and collective online information resources, such as shared information repositories, has been influential in both the disciplines of communication and organization studies. Over his entire career, he's made important contributions to the studies of communication networks, and most notably in his book, Theories of Communication Networks, and through his evolutionary theory of communication networks. Congratulations, Peter Manji. Thank you. I'd like us all to have one last extension of appreciation and respect for our award winners this evening. What each of you have accomplished is extremely admirable and reflects well, of course, on you, your institution, and the National Association in general, and indeed, the entire communication discipline. And we have one more presentation this evening. It's my honor to present this ceremonial gavel to First Vice President Steve Beebe as a symbolic passing of the torch to the next NCA president. So while this certainly concludes the 2012 Address and Awards Ceremony, and we have congratulations to everyone here, we close the ceremony, but in my eyes, we continue the legacy of excellence here, and thank you very much.